Welcome to episode two of Antimatter Garage. In the first episode, I hiked the Corolla pretty strongly, so I'm ready to get started on my wife's Solara. Yeah. I just, this is just, this is how things go, you know? I want to get the Corolla done, and this is why it's been a long project because something always comes up. In this case, um, what precipitated the event was my wife backed into a tree, and despite the backup camera, and she did a little damage and of course she wasn't really happy about it and she wanted to get it fixed and let me show you what the front of the car looked like. So yeah, as you can see here, there are a lot of little chip marks and the headlights aren't in that great a condition and there's some damage there on the uh, passenger side. I was actually driving when that happened. It was night and there, uh, the cars went everywhere and that left me with this big orange thing. I don't even know what it was. I think it was a Bob's Barricade, but it had already been mostly destroyed by the time I hit it, but it broke the um, the fog light and it did all that damage to the bumper that you can see there and so it's time to get that fixed as well. But I've been having problems with the headlights and uh, let me explain that a little bit. Uh, a while back I wanted to, um, in the original headlights were getting kind of foggy and we painted the car and I thought well this is a good time to put brand new headlights on and so I went on eBay and I found some that had this sort of black trim around the outside which I thought would be really nice on a black car and uh, in fact they did look very nice. Unfortunately the fit and fitment was just uh, not real good. The uh, quality was bad, the light up it was very sort of blobular and uh, eventually one of the tabs broke off of the side markers and just sort of fell out and was dangling on the side of the car so, uh, so I replaced them or at least I wanted to replace them with OEMs and I checked in Toyota and they were like $500 and I was like, eh, maybe eBay isn't so bad and I, if I don't get the little trendy black outlined ones, you know, so I got the ones you see or saw there in that clip and the fit and finish was better on the lights, but the light output quality was really horrible. Here's what it looked like and you can see that um, it's almost a little scary, right? I mean, it's okay, you got light, you can see where you're going, kind of, but it's, it's still pretty dark there. So, uh, I'm back to OEM, right? And I figured, well, I'm a car guy, and I think the front of this car could use a slightly different look, so why not make my own? And that's what I did. And the plan was that I would basically just use the same housing and then just shove some lights from a car that I think look good inside the housing. I chose a Chevy Sonic. Well, I know the Chevy Sonic isn't a high-end car, but I think the lights look kind of good. And hopefully I can steal an image here and you can see what they look like. And I measured and they would fit inside the housing. So I contacted a nearby junkyard, or not so nearby junkyard actually, a pick and pool kind of place. And they told me they had one and that they had the lights and I should come on down. So I did. When I got there, this is what it looked like. Yeah, there's no way that the headlights survived that accident, and they didn't have anything. So I looked around, and I wound up finding this. It's a headlight out of a BMW 750iL. So I bought those with the idea of putting them inside, just like I mentioned, and things kind of went wrong. The bulbs weren't fitting, and I went online to try and find out why and what I could do about it, and I found a place called the theretrofitsource.com, and as it turns out, I really could have just gone there in the first place because they have everything you need. And they're really cool about it because apparently this is a thing. People retrofit their headlights all the time, like every car they get and uh, they have a lot of supplies and everything they do really is kind of custom. So when you tell them, well, I got this really weird thing, it's 97 BMW and it's a 99 Solara and I'm doing this and that, and they'll go, yeah, mm -hmm, okay, no problem. Yeah, we'll just send you some stuff. And then they do and it's right. So they're not a sponsor, obviously. I don't have any viewers. So, uh, but I was pretty pleased with, um, with the service I got there. And so that's kind of the way it went. I. Um, put together the headlights, and this is how I did it. Okay, since the car has been hit like, uh, I don't know, two, three times in the front, the hood no longer pops open the way it should. Here it goes. See, it barely moves. It doesn't spring up like it used to. Now I'm gonna pull uh, the bumper. Well, I think it's kind of weird. It's like one thing locks something else in place. There's this 
there's a screw it says underneath here that holds the bu front bumper cover on. When I went to take this off, it was locked in place. Oh, crap. Yeah, there it is. Could have left the grill on. Ugh. So I'd like to thank Toyota for making this an easy access. There's a bolt right here. And the only way I can get onto it is with this ratcheting device. And I stick it on, this ratcheting wrench, I stick it on and I can go a little bit. And then, because it's slop in here, I have to go two clicks and then put it back on or else it won't go on in the right position. And then I can get another little tiny turn on it. On the other side, I was able to eventually get my fingers on there and undo it. But this side has this, has this, uh, this thing here sticking out so I can't get my fingers on there even though I'm using my other hand I swear this is the kind of thing that just makes it go so slow okay six hours and 10,577 little tiny clicks later I finally got halfway done taking that bolt off in retrospect I think maybe if I could have taken the wheel off in the fender liner I don't know it's right here I'm just not I'm just not seeing getting to that any other way. And it unfortunately, it was one of those nuts that just stayed tight all the way to the end. And I, when I finally got it off, man, it was it was a pain. And uh, you can see the um, protective styrofoam underneath. This is a real hard crash, in prote uh, ca crash protection uh, foam that they put behind the bumper. Only got a little bit of damage here on that impact. Uh, but it does look like it went all the way through, which means there should be a hole here somewhere. How would you like to go upside down? That looks like a well to me. Where is it? Oh, it's up here. Okay, let's see. Yeah, it was right here. Interesting, it almost looks like it melted on impact. It's pretty weird. Uh, let's see, tabs are okay, tabs, tabs. A lot of this stuff isn't nearly as bad as I thought, so in a way, I'm kind of glad that they're just going to fix it. Let's see. Uh, I can see, so this doesn't look too bad. This looks like it might be bent out. And of course, this is bent out, so I'll try and straighten that a little bit. And the bumper... It's actually kind of okay. Hmm, it just seems like the hood should close easier than this. Maybe I can, here's the latch, you know, maybe it looks like it's maybe angled down. Let me back out a little bit. Looks like it's maybe angled this way a little bit. I could try and pull it out a little bit and see what happens then. Uh, but mostly I was just trying to get to the uh, headlights, so I'm gonna pull those out. This is the one I'm gonna start on, I think. I don't know, I have to go check, check what I did. Well, anyway, I don't know if that's of any interest to anybody, but uh, it doesn't look too bad. Okay. Watch your car, your truck will start to slide. Yeah. <laughs> All right, time to get this headlight into the oven. See if the cover fits what I've already been doing. So as you can see here, the direction of travel of the car is this direction and that's the direction the lights need to point. But the front face takes this big angle and curve and it's also angled along this plane so that it makes it difficult to have anything to line it up with. So what I did was I sort of determined uh, earlier this front face and I drew a line, but it's still hard because the parts are inside and not outside where I drew the line. And it can, you know, we can get close, but um, getting it, I'm not sure how close. And so I'm not really sure about the mounting, so I'm going to come up with my own. All right, you just uh, preheat the oven to 210 degrees. Pre uh, lightly grease a cookie sheet. Just kidding. And you stick it in there and bake for like 10 or 15 minutes. It'll be quite hot when it comes out, but then you just uh, pry it apart. The cool thing is the way these are built, there are these little tabs. And so it's not too bad to stick something in here and just pull it apart. It came apart pretty easily compared to some of the ones I've seen on the internet. 
All right, FYI, I think 210 degrees may be a little excessive. Um, everything was very pliable, the black material as well as the front cover. In fact, the black's more pliable than the front cover, but I applied a little pressure to this, just a little bit, and it popped right off. So I don't think I need this housing. The purpose of this, because I'm already working on the front uh, right, the passenger side headlight, is to get this off and see if it fits in the headlight I've been working on. Oh, and also, no, it doesn't really smell. Uh, it's not a problem to just put it in the kitchen uh, oven if anybody's interested in knowing. That doesn't, however, mean that your significant other is going to allow it. Okay, I think I have a title for this video now. It's called How Not to Modify Headlights. Allow me to explain. This is the headlight that I'm modifying. I cut it off along basically a flat line. I was hoping to put a flat plate back here to seal it back up. But the problem is I need something bigger than this little tiny thin lip here to bond to or attach, let's just say attach to. Um, and that line goes from vertical to like a 45 to like a flat right through here making it complex. So if I made like a little wall that came around it wouldn't be a wall, it would be perpendicular to the plastic at this point versus being parallel here where I get like a lot of surface area to glue on or screw to. So this complex shape has kind of got me thrown for a loop. So I've made this metal band to go inside. I had to shape it to the contours here, which turned out to be a lot simpler than I thought it was gonna be. It was actually kind of fun. Um, you can see a gap between there. I'm not sure what way angle to hold it at, but it doesn't matter because if the sealant does its job, it will not only glue that in place, but it will seal that off. Yesterday when I welded this up, I filled it with water and a little bit leaked around the edges where I guess I had some pinholes or something. So then I used some black RTV silicone around the outside. It's clearly holding water out. It's been like this for about a half an hour and these paper towels are dry all the way around. So I'm convinced that so far it's watertight. It's basically a three point mounting system. There will be uh, the ball We'll, the ball socket will be up here, the adjuster down here, and I'll make an adjuster that'll fit in here somewhere for here. And then, so what happens then is if, oh, I'm sorry, it'll be up on this guy. So what happens is if you hold these two points stable, and if you hold these two points stable, and this point is pushed out, it will move up and down. It'll move the beam of the light up and down. And if you hold these two points stable and do this one, it'll move it uh, left and right. So that's kind of how it works. So the ball will stay stationary and these ones will move. Right now, what I found is for the light to function properly or to look good and to function properly, it needs to be mounted like this. The top needs to be up. So right now I'm building a little structure that goes underneath that will hold it up. And that's why I was talking about needing the tape between these two pieces. So if there's any relative motion, they won't scratch and then start to rust or whatever because these, both these pieces are steel. And I'll paint that and I'll, I'll use that tape that I ordered. It hasn't come in yet either. To do that. So what I'm going to work on today is this little thing that will hold the light up.
Arr. I got a shard of metal in my eye. This would make the fourth time in my life that I've gotten something in my eye while wearing eye protection. Careful out there, it's a dangerous world. So and here's the little piece that I welded up uh, to hold it, to hold the light at that angle that I was talking about in here. It's just clamped a little bit so I don't think it's gonna hold its own weight, but it goes something like that. So the good news is, if you look at it, the BMW one is on the left here, and the new one is on the right, and you can see that the footprint, this metal plate here where my finger is touching, is much bigger than that one. Even though the projector um, globe, I'm going to call it, is actually larger on the aftermarket one than the BMW one, and the BMW one is taller. So this is all excellent news, it means that hopefully I'll get decent performance out of this guy and it'll be easier to fit into the headlight housing. This is a bi-xenon light which I believe means you can flip this little switch here. It's a little solenoid that moves a door for high beam and low beam. Alright so I think I'm satisfied with the positioning of these guys. Now actually this guy's got to go a little bit more at an angle but he keeps falling over because I haven't quite gotten him in place yet. So here it is on the car. I had to fix a little damage here. This was bent. I was able just to move it back with my hands. Uh, starting to shape up. Um, looks like this one needs to come that way a little bit, but it'll touch in the back and I'm afraid this will fall out. I can just picture it hitting the ground now and cracking or something. But, <clears throat> I don't know, I think it's looking not too bad. And this is what it's going to be, because uh, no turning back now. Okay, so I've done a top plate now, and it mounts over here so that it can do the adjustment. Okay, I had a little victory here, strangely. I found a grommet, rubber grommet, that would fit tightly onto this bolt, and I was able to force it in to drill the hole the right size for the grommet, and I was able to get the screw in. It's nice and tight, and I think it'll make a pretty decent moisture-tight seal. I mean, I can hardly even turn that by finger. So that's really cool. A uh, little hint here, by the way, if you're ever putting in a rubber part somewhere, like maybe an exhaust hanger or something like this, lube it up first. It'll go in the hole easier, and whatever you're putting through the hole will go in easier. Uh, don't use anything petroleum, though. It could eat away at the rubber. That's what she said. I'm finally moving forward, I think, but I just had to show you. So here are the six points. One, two, three, four, five, six that mount the two headlights. And I know this doesn't look great, it'll look better soon, and also nobody's going to see it. But if I can only tell you all of the crap I went through to get to this point, all the little fiddly bits, all the little mistakes, all the little three-dimensional spaces I had to cram my fingers into. Also, I guess from the heating of the welding and, and bolting it down, you can see here there's a pretty big gap now that I have to fill. This was a small gap before. And after installing it, I put a couple of screws in the top, and, and it kind of bows in the middle. So now, in fact, there's a gap everywhere, just about, when before there was really only a small gap along here. So I guess, hopefully I can fill all that in. Uh, it isn't easy. Do yourself a favor. Just buy new, just to buy new headlights at the dealership or something. The next step was to cut out a piece of cardboard in the shape that I needed that I could then use as a template to transfer through the, to the back cover and get it right the first time. And you can see I still need a little trimming here. It's touching and maybe a little extra clearance here and here. I can't go too far because there's only a little bit of a lip there to put a gasket in. So, But uh, it's not looking too bad. So here's the electrical layout of the system. Um, it all starts right here. The original harness has a connector that comes in here. It would normally plug directly onto the headlight, but instead it goes to the headlight for high beam only. That's why there are only two. And so the original system will control the high beam, the interior high beam, I should say. And that signal goes into here, which then goes up to the basically the brains of the operation. It has a number of battery and ground connections and so uh, one 
leg goes over to the ballast on one side of the car, which then sends a signal to the headlight, but it also sends a signal to the high beam of this headlight so that I actually have two high beams, one that comes with the um, projector and the one that's already on the car. And then this goes over to the other ballast for the other side of the car, which also feeds the projectors. It's got its own ground. And then here, this plugs directly into the existing harness for the other high beam, which is, serves the same function as this piece over here. And it also only has two connectors, which is what confused me because it's a three connector plug, but the other connector would be for low beam, which it, that function won't exist. In addition, they gave me this little guy here, and that controls the solenoid for, uh, the, that's in the high beam of the projector lens. So I laid this out because I need to know, for instance, I was thinking about putting um, this ballast and this ballast on the same side, like all, melt basically all this on one board and then just run the wires. But to do that, um, they won't reach. You know, this ballast needs to come over. Uh, the left, the, this ballast has to come over to the other headlight to work. So I know I'm gonna have to find a place to mount that one on one side of the car and then maybe all the rest of this on the other side of the car. I'd say the cost was fairly reasonable. I mean, this stuff's relatively expensive. Um, one of these things is that's like $175. All this other stuff was, I want to say like 80 and then another 175 this one. If you add it all up, I'd say I'm about equal to or perhaps just a tiny bit more expensive than stock headlights bought at Toyota. Definitely way more expensive than headlights bought on eBay. But I believe that this system will outperform either of those. So given how short this wire is, this is really the only place I have to mount this, right here. And I pre-drilled those holes, and here's a little hint if you're ever doing this kind of work. Make sure you paint it, because if you leave the raw edges exposed, it will rust, at least if you live in Florida. making the uh, second headlight, I'm trying to just duplicate what I did on the one side as closely as possible. I know it won't be exact, but it doesn't matter because it'll be close enough, I think, then I can just modify it. So this one goes that way. You can see the notch. It's on the other side. So I'm just now looking at this headlight the way it is. That's the back of the headlight that I've welded in there, but if you pretended that was a headlight, this sort of deep set look is kind of mean. I think I like it. Maybe I should have done something more like that. Of course, there's really no room for something like that. The headlight would all be in here. So I'm making use of this connector. It is um, an RF connector, it stands for radio frequency. Let me move away, see if it'll focus. This is specifically an SMA connector. I think it stands for sub miniature architecture. And the cable it's attached to is a 141 semi-rigid cable. I uh, don't recommend these. They're very expensive. I got some on eBay. Um, but I, I like to use them because they look really cool. And in this case, I'm making kind of making my own little LED light bulb out of it. And I'll show you the finished product later. All right, so I've made this little L bracket and I've attached it with a couple of magnets and I've got my RF connector on here. There's a bulkhead SMA connector on here and on the other side you can see that's where the LED will go. Actually I need to keep positioning it here a little bit but that's how I'm gonna hold it in place. I'm gonna carve out excuse me I'm gonna carve out that um, semi-rigid cable and then put the um, LED right basically where the tip of that semi-rigid cable is right now to properly illuminate this reflector with the right color. So I can I can kind of swivel it around and I can move it and I can bend it and then when I get done I'm going to uh, use glue instead of magnets to hold it on. I'd like to use the magnets but they're uh, I just don't think they're strong enough. 
the glue seems to hold on steel, so I'm kind of assuming that will work. That's the plan. I'm in the window still here where I can get a little bit of light. So this is the mill spec connector, and these connections on the inside are all just soldered. So I made sure before I soldered them that I put uh, some heat shrink on there just to keep them all sort of separated. Uh, then I'm going to heat shrink them down, and because I don't rely on solder alone, I'm going to try and pot this uh, area, which means you put some glue around it to stiffen it up, give it some strain relief, hold it in place, that kind of thing. And then, I, so I wrung it out before I got to this point to make sure each one of these connections went through and didn't short to anywhere else. And so I think, uh, I think it's good to go. This is what it's going to look like on the inside of the headlight. Here's my resistor pack. It's two 150 ohm resistors put in series for 300 ohms. Okay, another problem. This is the LED that I created. You can see that it comes up through here, and from here up, it's kind of like its own separate little bulb. It goes through the hole in the um, reflector, and I played around a little bit with the way it would look best in the reflector, and it seemed to look the best when the LED was close to the focal point, kind of like the halogen light is. So that's sort of the way that I built it, and I have just a little bit of adjustment, not much. That's when at some point I figured out, doy, this bulb gets to be over like 500 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm pretty sure that in, what is that, an eighth of an inch away, maybe three millimeters, that LED is probably just gonna melt. So now I need to maybe redo this bulb, making it shorter, I'm thinking about putting it sort of toward the edge and hopefully that'll look good enough. But I don't know if an inch is gonna be enough space between there to melt it as well. So I'm not really sure what to do. I didn't really think that part through. What I'm thinking my about what I'm thinking about doing is pulling the LED out and putting a thermocouple there and turning on the halogen light and see how hot it gets. And then uh, if I find that it's not too bad then I could put the light there, but if it's, say, still 300 degrees over there and the LED can't handle it, then, frankly, i just probably leave the LED off. It's not that big of a deal to me in the first place, and if I'd known it was going to be such a hassle, I'd probably just skipped it. Uh. All right, so what I've done here is I've installed the headlight, and I've plugged it into the just the stock wiring harness because it handles halogen bulbs, and I've put a thermocouple here, as you can see, pretty close to the halogen bulb, which I don't want to touch. I've also put one behind here. I was kind of interested in seeing how much heat came out this hole. After that, I might also check to see how hot it gets sort of in front here where the lens will be because the original headlights were sort of back here and had a lot more space between them and the front. I'm hoping this isn't going to like melt that. Uh, I think the worst case scenario here is it's possible I wouldn't be able to use these high beams, which wouldn't matter because the projector that goes here would still work. The fact is I don't really use high beams very long. I can only imagine having ever left them on continuously for maybe a half an hour. Uh, you rarely get a spot where the road is dark and there aren't any cars on it, that you don't have to shut them off and turn them back on constantly. So, I, I don't know, we'll find out. Let's see what happens here. Right now I'm reading an ambient temperature of about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, which sounds reasonable. It's warm out here. So, uh, that's on uh, thermocouple one, which is the one by the halogen. So I'm gonna go turn on the lights, assuming the battery still works, and we'll see what happens. Okay, I just turned it on. It's been on for like, I don't know, 10 seconds. And you can see the temperature is quickly rising. This isn't a perfect test because, of course, when the headlight is encapsulated, things will start to heat up even more, like a little oven. What I can tell you is I have my hand right here and I can definitely feel a lot of heat. So 188. We'll just let this stabilize and I'll come back. All right, so it's been a few minutes. I went inside to get the tripod and you can see that it's still sort of hovering around the 220s range or so. Really interesting to note is I'm standing next to the tripod and my leg is maybe two and a half feet away from the headlight and I can feel the heat of the beam on my leg. It kind of makes me wonder how far away I can go and still feel that heat. It's kind of amazing the things you don't really think about. So, all right, um, the other thermocouple is showing me 
pretty low temperatures, 91. So I don't think I have to worry about this bulb due to the reflector pushing all the heat this direction. I don't think I have to worry about it heating up the rest of the headlight lamp and melting anything, which was one of my concerns. Uh, so now I'm going to put the, uh, let me go back here. I'm gonna put the lens on sort of gently and let's see how much hotter it gets. Okay, so this has been cooking for uh, seven minutes or so, and you can see that uh, the temperature stabilized around 250. It kind of bounces around again a little bit, but uh, it's really not, it's not going up anymore. So I'm calling it at about 250 near there. I can feel this lens is really hot. Uh, it's got a hot spot right smack in the center, more so than others. Um, but I can still touch it, so I don't think that the light's in any danger of melting. So there you have it, if you're ever wondering. Question is, at what temperature does an LED melt? <laughs> Let me check. All right, for you Celsius type people, so 120 or so Celsius. Okay, so the headlights are essentially done. I have to, um, I still have to seal them up in the back and in the front. But I kind of wanted to align them before I did that just to see like what if I couldn't align them and I needed to take the whole thing apart again. So I kind of wanted to align them without the lenses, see how everything went. The problem is I have to drive the car tomorrow, which means that I kind of need to, if I wait till night to do this, then I'm gonna be up all night trying to put the front of the car back together. So these lights are kind of bright. I'm hoping that I'll be able to see them on the door in the daylight, even though the sun is behind me, we will find out. But anyway, here's kind of what it looks like. You can see the tape is still on the headlights. I'm going to pull that off, lay in some uh, of that rubbery butyl stuff, and then cook the lens and seal it up from behind. Now, I left everything kind of exposed. There's no vanity plate here between these two. I guess it has kind of an unfinished look. Um, it doesn't bother me. I think it looks kind of cool, but at the same time, if it's really obvious once the lenses go on and I don't like it, then uh, I may have to take them apart again and, and do something about that. But at least for now, I'll be able to drive the car uh, tomorrow. We're going to be coming home at night, so I'm going to need lights. So that's the plan. Let's see how it goes. So there was no way I was seeing it on that garage door. It was, surprisingly, the sun is brighter than headlights. But over here in the shade, you can actually see the lines. Uh, and so I'm using that to adjust. Fortunately, it's working out. You can see the right uh, headlight is a really low right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and fix that and should be done. So here it is, getting ready to put the front bumper cover on. I have not polished the headlights yet, but they look pretty good as is. And I'll give you a shot of the lights on, but I can do that after I put the cover on. I'm running out of daylight here. There it is. It looks kind of stock, and frankly, the whole front is still let down by that bumper, but that was the whole reason for doing this. It'll be painted soon, and hopefully that'll improve the looks. I'd like to put a lower chin spoiler down here, but um, my wife agrees it should be lower there, but doesn't agree on how to handle it, and it's her car, so. Uh, I have two new fog lights for the bottom there. I'll have the guy who paints them put them in. Uh, they'll look really good. I think this actually looks the way the car should look, to be honest. It doesn't look real aftermarket to me. It looks kind of like it should. In this light, I mean, you can't, I think, I can't even see the projectors. Uh, I think you can't on the video either, but uh, I can take some day shots as well. Right now I'll go turn them on and show you what they look like. So that should be low beam. That should be high beam. So this video is turning out a little bit longer than I'd intended, so I'm just gonna kinda hurry through this here. We drove the car with the lights on and they appear to be a little bit adjusted low. And unfortunately, due to all the eyeballing that I did to get the headlights done, I ran out of adjustment on the passenger side. It's, it's as high as it's going to go, I think. 
So what I'm going to do now is uh, see if there's enough adjustment on the driver's side. Uh, then I'll check the passenger side. If I can get any more out of it, I might get lucky. I kind of doubt it. I have a feeling I'm going to be pulling off the bumper and putting the light back into the oven and pulling it apart and fixing things. So I see what was going on here. As you can see, there is still a little bit of adjustment room um, down in there. But when I do that, The headlight isn't moving, only this is moving. It's just getting some flex in there, even though I, I strengthen it. And I think it's just, um, it just really needs uh, the ball down here extended out a little bit. Pushing everything out, allowing me to adjust it backward a little bit more. So I think it's not too bad of a repair. All right, so the, this project is finally finished. Okay, it's 99% finished. Like most things in my life, I can't seem to ever get 100%. You may notice that this light is a little bit foggy, uh, and that's my fault, because what happened was, uh, as I was going through the process that Chris Fix laid out to uh, permanently solve your um, cloudy headlight problem, I sprayed the clear coat on a little bit too thick, and in my infinite wisdom, I thought, well, I'll just wipe it all off real quick, you know, while it's still wet, and then just repeat it and, and instead of waiting, waiting for it to dry. And uh, that may work with latex interior paints, and, and it does. I've done that before, uh, but not with paints that dry this quickly. And um, so it left this foggy appearance, and I've already tried to correct it once, and I think I didn't sand deep enough. But the process is essentially what I did before, so you don't need to see it. I'll take care of it off camera. This headlight actually turned out really good. I'm very happy with it. Now, the rest of it, the paint and some of the damage, uh, that's a different story as well. I've lived in this area for a long time, and I've had various um, cars painted to various extents, from the entire uh, paint job to just some minor repairs, and I've been pretty dissatisfied with pretty much every place I've gone. So I called a buddy of mine, uh, or texted him and said, hey, you know, uh, he's a real car guy, you know, where do you recommend? And he suggested this guy who kind of works out of his garage and he's getting kind of up there in, in age and, and his health isn't that great and he's a very strange person actually uh, but he seemed to really care about what he did and he uh, had decades of experience working in shops and um, most importantly you know he didn't charge very much what's important to note about this car is uh, despite its condition it's about a thousand dollar car and it's 335,000 miles on it it's 20 years old and it, insurance companies, if you're not familiar with this, at least in the state of Florida, uh, and I'm not sure what the number is, it's either 70 or 80 percent, let's just go with 80. If the cost of the repair is worth 80 percent the value of the car, they consider it a total. I had some uh, damage repaired on my Spider on the front bumper, and I don't know, maybe it was out of laziness, but they, always, they just wanted to replace the bumper and then paint it without doing the actual repairs. For one bumper alone on that car was $750. So if I had claimed this on, on, on insurance, uh, especially considering there was a little bit of damage on the back as well, they would have totaled this car. And it's just too good of a car to let go to a crusher. Uh, my opinion is, yes, I would like to drive different cars. I would love to have the experience of something new instead of always driving these same three cars for decades and decades on end. But I've got a good one, and I don't see any reason to go spend 30 grand on a new car, uh, assuming I could even be happy with a $30,000 car these days, or even a year old car, uh, just to have a whole bunch of problems with it. So this is a keeper until it literally is uh, totaled, and unfortunately that leads me to do a lot of these kinds of repairs. and. I had this guy do it and he charged me only $800 and he painted the bumper, the hood, uh, the sides down where there were some mud flaps that we deleted, and um, the back bumper of course, and just on his own because he felt they needed it, the two mirrors. So we actually got quite a bit done. Am I happy with it? No. Um, just like most of the other places I've been to, I can see flaws everywhere. On the other hand, out of all the places I've been to, he's probably done the best job. This leads to another question. 
Automatic transmissions and paint and body are two things that I've been kind of staying away from as my career as car guy. I know that I'm an impatient person and to do, you know, it's all in the prep work and to do all that sanding, uh, I, I just, I don't have the patience for it. So that begs the question, if somebody with that many years of experience, decades of experience doing this kind of work has this many flaws in the paint, um, what chance do I stand? So this is a bridge that I may cross at some point, but not right now. Uh, what I can tell you is that it's in pretty good condition, and if you back off, I don't think the camera's even going to pick up any of these little flaws. It's one of those things you have to see when you're intimate with, uh, you know, painting and, I mean, uh, uh, waxing and washing the car and that sort of thing. Uh, so I just have to get it through my mind. It's a thousand dollar car. Uh, it's not going to have a show quality paint job. I didn't pay for a show quality paint job. Uh, it looks much better, I think you'll see. In fact, I'm going to leave you now uh, in this video with some before and after shots of various things that I've shown you along the way. Uh, I hope this was enjoyable to watch. I'm new to this YouTube thing and I think over time I will get the, the little less talking and a little bit more content. Um, I'm working on it, and uh, but I hope, I hope that I've, I've given you something enjoyable to see. Thank you.